Hello dear students, welcome to the lecture 13 of Introduction to Programming 2 with C Sharp course as known as Advanced Programming and uh, this week we are going to see uh, our uh, missing topics from the previous week which I have collected from uh, popular Udemy courses so in this uh, course we have covered all of the Udemy courses uh, coverings that I could find uh, for C Sharp programming language and we even uh, we are even uh, teaching more of the Udemy courses some of the topics we cover here is not even listed on uh, Udemy courses so this week I am composing a console application with uh, .NET Core okay so let's pick our uh, repository okay lecture 13 cmd okay dot net core 5 current okay so let's start with heap hash table stacks and queries okay Introduction Even though with the .NET framework we don't have to actively worry about memory management and garbage collection GC, we still have to keep memory management and GC in mind in order to optimize the performance of our applications. Also, having a basic understanding of how memory management works will help explain the behavior of the variables we work with in every program we write. In this article, I'll cover the basics of the stack and heap, types of variables, and why some variables work as they do. There are two places the .NET framework stores items in memory as your code executes. If you haven't already met, let me introduce you to the stack and the heap. Both the stack and heap help us run our code. They reside in the operating memory on our machine and contain the pieces of information we need to make it all happen. Stack versus heap. What's the difference? The stack is more or less responsible for keeping track of what's executing in our code or what's been called. The heap is more or less responsible for keeping track of our objects, our data, well, most of it will get to that later. Okay, so the main difference is in the stack, what is executing is hold. Like uh, the methods we make, uh, method calls or... Um, returning from calls, events, or such. Uh, so it is about keeping track uh, of what is executing. And heap is where the bigger object is saved. Like our uh, instance of classes, and uh, like uh, lists, dictionaries, and such. Think of the stack as a series of boxes stacked one on top of the next. We keep track of what's going on in our application by stacking another box on top every time we call a method, called a frame. We can only use what's in the top box on the stack. When we're done with the top box, the method is done executing, we throw it away and proceed to use the stuff in the previous box on the top of the stack. The heap is similar except that its purpose is to hold information, not keep track of execution most of the time, so anything in our heap can be accessed at any time. With the heap, there are no constraints as to what can be accessed like in the stack. The heap is like the heap of clean laundry on our bed that we have not taken the time to put away yet we can grab what we need quickly. The stack is like the stack of shoe boxes in the closet where we have to take off the top one to get to the one underneath it. So stack is first in, first out, and heap is whenever in, whenever out. Okay, so this is like stack and this is like heap. The picture above, while not really a true representation of what's happening in memory, helps us distinguish a stack from a heap. The stack is self-maintaining, meaning that it basically takes care of its own memory management. When the top box is no longer used, it's thrown out. And uh, however stack is limited, you know there is stack overflow exception which means uh, stack is full and the entire website is based on stack overflow you already know that i am sure of it 
So this is the error of uh, stack overflowing, basically. Out. The heap, on the other hand, has to worry about garbage collection (GC), which deals with how to keep the heap clean. No one wants dirty laundry laying around; it stinks. What goes on the stack and heap? We have four main types of things we'll be putting in the stack and heap as our code is executing: value types, reference types, pointers, and instructions. Value types. Okay, uh, let's start taking notes of our lectures. What are heap and stack in .NET and C Sharp? Uh, what are the differences between stack and heap? Okay, which uh, type of um, let's call them as okay things, e.g. Uh, Let's say volatile class or mm or int value type reference type are put in okay, stack and heap memory. Okay, and let's continue. Okay, so value types. In C Sharp, all the things declared with the following list of type declarations are value types because they are from system.valueType. So these are Boolean 0, 1 byte, uh, which is uh, up to uh, 0 to 255, and character, decimal, double, enumeration, float. We already seen all of them, actually. And there is then reference types. Reference types. All the things declared with the types in this list are reference types and inherit from system, object, except, of course, for object, which is the system, object, object. So which are class, in, in, uh, interface, delegate, object, string, we already know that. Uh, string is also a reference type, this is an important difference. Actually, we will see more about this in the next semester in Object-Oriented Programming Language course. Uh, so I won't um, get delve into a lot of details here. Uh, let's just continue to read about pointers. Pointers. The third type of thing to be put in our memory management scheme is a reference to a type. A reference is often referred to as a pointer. We don't explicitly use pointers. They are managed by the common language runtime, CLR. Believe me, that this is the greatest part of C Sharp when compared to C++ or C. You have to work with pointers and they are extremely annoying. And I'm glad that there is no, there. I'm glad that we don't have to use pointers in C Sharp for handling object types or references or whatever. A pointer or reference is different than a reference type in that when we say something is a reference type is a means we access it through a pointer. Okay, this is also important. Uh, there is a pointer and a reference type and differences pointer points us to the object of reference type. Okay, uh, from the picture we will understand better. A pointer is a chunk of space in memory that points to another space in memory. A pointer takes up space just like any other thing that we're putting in the stack, and heap and its value is either a memory address or null. Therefore, pointer is very small because it is just pointing to a memory address. However, in heap, the value of pointer can be huge. Pointer can be in stack or in heap, as you can see like here. It can be in both of them. Okay, so what are value types, reference types? Pointers, these, can, these are also references. And then there is one thing more, which is instructions. And instructions are the instructions, basically. Such as method calls or other things. 
so this is the how they are stored this is what is about being pointer in pointer there is no value there is no data it just points to a memory location and from that memory location we, we read the data okay and then there is the instructions instructions you'll see how the instructions work later in this article how is it decided what goes where ha huh. Okay, one last thing, and we'll get to the fun stuff. Here are our two golden rules. A reference type always goes on the heap easy enough, right? Value types and pointers always go where they were declared. This is a little more complex and needs a bit more understanding of how the stack works to figure out where things are declared. The stack, as we mentioned earlier, is responsible for keeping track of where each thread is during the execution of our code or what's been called okay this is important you see each thread is kept in stack okay so this is where we uh, store data such as which thread is running executing which method or which code or whatever so it is about keeping things in order you know that uh, our application is running from top to bottom and this is done with the stack and with them we can also spawn uh, sub threads or tasks or other things and uh, start using uh, uh, more uh, threads and they are all kept in stack memory and it is how uh, stack handles that and all reference types are going into heap so there is no reference type object uh, stored in stack However, uh, for value types, they can be both in heap or stack. You can think of it as a thread state, and each thread has its own stack. When our so you see, each set, uh, each thread has their own stack, and all threads are also kept in a main stack or something like that. Our code makes a call to execute a method. The thread starts executing the instructions that have been JIT compiled and live on the method table. It also puts the method's parameters on the thread stack. Then, as we go through the code and run into variables within the method, they are placed on top of the stack. This will be easiest to understand by example. Take the following method. Okay, this is a very, really easy method. It just adds 5 to a value that we are getting. So there is int result. Uh, result is equal to value uh, plus 5, and then we return result. So here, what is happening at the top of very uh, to the top of stack? Here's what happens at the very top of the stack. Keep in mind that what we are looking at is placed on top of many other items already living in the stack. So it is added top of many other items. Okay, uh, this is important to remember. Once we start executing the method, the method's parameters are placed on the stack. We'll talk more about passing parameters later. And it is like that. Okay, uh, I won't go more about this uh, because this is the, as I said, the topic of the next semester. It is the topic of the object-oriented programming. However, if you are interested in, you can read more on this article. There are also UC part 2, part 3, and part 4. This is a really long article about heaping and stacking. And... Um, can we define heap or stack in C sharp? I think they are fully automatic. Okay, I think there is no defining that, and there is then hash tables and queries. Okay, so let's uh, remember about what is hash table. Okay. And we take another uh, um, note here. Okay, let's continue to with hash tables. The hash table class represents a collection of key and value pairs that are organized based on the hash code of the key. It uses the key to access the elements in the collection. A hash table is used when you need to access elements by using key, and you can identify a useful key value. Each item in the hash table has a key slash value pair. The key is used to access the items in the collection. So it is a thing that keeps uh, things in order with keys and values. 
okay so let's uh, do this example here okay we are adding hash table and to be able to use hash table we have to define okay we have to define system uh, i mean that we have to add reference of systems collections here then we are adding with keys and values to the hash table then we can say if hash table contains or not then we can for each the uh, keys and then print the values of hash uh, table so this is very similar to the dictionary what is the difference between hash table and dictionary hash table and dictionary in okay c sharp let's see the difference as well this is exactly as dictionary okay they are all uh, printed on the screen okay let's see the differences the following table lists the differences between hash table and dictionary in c sharp hash table dictionary hash table is included in the system collections namespace dictionary is included in the system collections generic namespace hash table is a loosely typed non-generic collection this means it stores key value pairs of any data types dictionary is a generic collection so it can store key value pairs of specific data types okay types Hash table is thread safe. Only public static members are thread safe in dictionary. Okay, so. But dictionary is also not very st uh, actually thread safe. I'm not sure if this information is true. I don't know, it is written everywhere, but I am not sure if it is thread safe because I am pretty sure it is not. okay so this is the correct answer yeah you see some of the information you find on the internet may be wrong this is a really important uh, difference a subtle but important difference is that hash table supports multiple reader threads with a single writer thread while dictionary offers no thread safety if you need thread safety with a generic dictionary you must implement your own synchronization or in dotnet 4.0 use concurrent dictionary and this answer is given by mark gravel i think this is one of the very top guys in stack overflow you see and probably very true also mvp uh, so you see hash table is thread safe for reader threads however for writer thread you also need to have a synchronization on the single thread i can write at any time for dictionary, there is no trace safety. For even reading, you have to have synchronization. And... Okay, so in dictionary instance methods are intense safe and it's the same. So are there any other thing? There is also another difference. Okay, this was another difference. Important one. There is one more important difference between a hash table and dictionary. If you use indexers to get a value out of a hash table, the hash table will successfully return null for a non-existent item, whereas the dictionary will throw an error if you try accessing an item using an indexer which does not exist in the dictionary. This is also important for so does that does that means that we can access a non-existing item like this or other way i will show in a moment 
Okay, let's try to access it like this and let's see if does if it does throw an error. Okay, it doesn't throw an error, so you can access elements of a uh, hash table uh, even if the if you even if it does not exist. So this returns null. Let's make a null check quickly, like we have earned it. Uh, like we have learned it. So I will do it like this. If it is equal to null, let's say um, this value does not exist. Else, let's just type the value itself like this. And now it will print that this is a null. Okay, you see this value does not exist. Okay, it is working. And there is also another uh, important information. Dictionary is typed, so value types don't need boxing. A hash table isn't, so value types need boxing. Hash table has a nicer way of obtaining a value than dictionary IMHO because it always knows the value is an object. Though if you're using .NET 3.5, it's easy to write an extension method for dictionary to get similar behavior. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that, let me show you, in hash table we don't define type. So everything is object typed and that means there will be boxing. Okay, so let's define a class, uh, okay, uh, public class cs temp equal to new okay uh, not equal to new of course let's define some integers okay and let's say double whatever we want and now i can compose instance of this class like this okay first yeah, instance equal to new plus and let's set values something like this and this dot this now i can add this to the hash table like this add you see it is asking object key and object value it can be anything okay anything and then the value can be this okay so what would happen if I edit this here? Okay. Okay, what would it print to the screen? It is printing to the screen lecture 13 CMD program plus CS temp. Basically, the class itself because it is boxed uh, as um class object so i have to change this to as is uh, cs temp then um i have to use i don't know if this will work okay that okay it didn't work this way so if cs temp is true Then um, CS temp HDK. Okay, I also need to take this into a parentheses and then okay, still not visible. Why? Yeah, public. So let's take this as like this. Okay, okay, property key as um just itself the string let's see what happens now okay the value is still not typed yeah so why i think it is because the uh, class and you see you have to put them into the correct uh, parentheses 
and now let's retry okay we are able to print the as you can see the value right now so this is how useful is is however if this was dictionary i would have to have a strong typing like let me show you okay to be able to use dictionary i need to add collections generic and then string as a key anything can be key and value will be cs temp otherwise i can't add okay like this i will initialize it and then i can add values as here simply so this is the difference between uh, dictionary and hash uh, tables and okay that is true Let's read this answer as well. The hash table class is a specific type of dictionary class that uses an integer value, called a hash, to aid in the storage of its keys. The hash table class uses the hash to speed up the searching for a specific key in the collection. Every object in .NET derives from the object class. This class supports the getHash method, which returns an integer that uniquely identifies the object. The hash table class is a very efficient collection in general. The only issue with the hash table class is that it requires a bit of overhead, and for small collections, fewer than 10 elements, the overhead can impede performance. Okay, so... Okay, there's another important answer as well. Let's start from here. I look up interface is used in .NET 3.5 with link. The hash table is the base class that is weakly type. The dictionary base abstract class is strongly typed and uses internally a hash table. I found a strange thing about dictionary. When we add the multiple entries in dictionary, the order in which the entries are added is maintained. Thus, if I apply a for each on the dictionary, I will get the records in the same order I have inserted them. Whereas, this is not true with normal hash table, as when I add same records in hash table the order is not maintained. As far as my knowledge goes, dictionary is based on hash table. If this is true, why my dictionary maintains the order but hash table does not? As to why they behave differently, it's because generic dictionary implements a hash table but is not based on system, collections, hash table. The generic dictionary implementation is based on allocating key value pairs from a list. These are then indexed with the hash table buckets for random access, but when it returns an enumerator, it just walks the list in sequential order which will be the order of insertion as long as entries are not reused. Okay, so these are the differences and the thread safety is not correct. Okay, this is also true. And data rate level is slower than dictionary because of boxing and unboxing. We have already shown that. What is boxing and unboxing? It, it just returns everything into a uh, object type. And then we need to do unboxing like this here. Okay, so let's see. Let's type that. Okay, and then there's quiz. Okay, let's see this. Okay. C sharp QT. Q is a special type of collection that stores the elements in FIFO style, first in first out, exactly opposite of the stack T collection. It contains the elements in the order they were added. C okay, so first in first out in stack, last in first out. Okay, why? Uh, because the last in is hold at the top in stack, 
and therefore it is last in first out and in FIFO it is first in first out. C Sharp includes generic QT and non generic Q collection. It is recommended to use the generic QT collection. You see, there is uh, the word that we uh, always see generic, and in this lecture, I am going to show you what what does generic means and how to how do we use it. QT characteristics. QT is FIFO first in first out collection. It comes under system collection generic namespace. QT can contain elements of the specified type. It provides compile time type checking and doesn't perform boxing unboxing because it is generic. Okay, so there is no boxing and unboxing in Q. Therefore, we have to define the type in here. Elements can be added using the NQ method. Cannot use collection initializer syntax. Elements can be retrieved using the DQ and the peak methods. It does not support an indexer. Okay, so there is also not an indexer, and let's just make this example here. Okay, so we are defining a queue. It is coming under systems collection generic, and we are adding, as you can see, four parameters. And this is the integer. We can also make it as string as well. It is up to us. We can make it anything we want. So let's um, entry. One, so it can hold any data as long as we define that data. Four, then you see we are able to for each that, and this is right. Okay, so what happens after we write them onto the screen? Okay, they are written like this, and uh, okay, it's uh, they are still there, so this will be console right line. Okay, and then there is also NQ, DQ, peak, and contains. So let's see this uh, example as well. In this for each, actually, it turns them into a list therefore they are not affected uh, not decrete or something so this is another example we enqueue them we write the number of elements like this then we are right lining but with decrete then there won't left any elements we will see that okay so the elements are like this and then zero elements is left and they are uh, printed on the screen with the order they are added as you can see hello okay then there is also peak let's check out the peak as well okay we don't need this in the dotnet console when we are working with debug okay so then we will use peak so the peak will show the first or uh, yeah first element only okay so does this take another thing no it doesn't take any value so with peak we can only see the first element in the queue nothing else yeah and it won't remove the element it doesn't support um indexing like we can't access element like this because it doesn't support indexing you see cannot apply indexing with expression of type q and yeah there is nothing else about queues okay what is of this Q and then there is NQ DQ NQ DQ contains okay and okay we have seen all these 
Okay, now time to see operator overloading, method overloading, and method overriding. Actually, we all already have seen all of this, but we will just remember again. All right, let's uh, start with uh, operator overloading. Okay, I think this is a good article to check it out. You can redefine or overload most of the built-in operators available in C-sharp. Okay, so here we are overloading uh, the built-in operators that we commonly use. Okay. Thus a programmer can use operators with user-defined types as well. Overloaded operators are functions with special names the keyword operator followed by the symbol for the operator being defined. Similar to any other function, an overloaded operator has a return type and a parameter list. Okay, so there is an example, uh, a box operator, which, co uh, which takes two box uh, instances and then returns a new box. Okay. So uh, here I will uh, code a custom class uh, to illustrate what does this mean. Uh, perhaps easier one okay so let's uh, put them into as uh, the first part or let's say part one like this and we can edit here and then comment it out okay so let's assume that we have public uh, car class. Okay, class car. And here let's define some properties. Okay, such as. Um, okay, I will define this as uh, long and total weight. Okay, and Bob and long okay okay um total price and okay and so here i define two car instances car one equal to new car and total price will be one thousand key uh 100 us dollar and total weight will be let's say 100 kilograms for first one and then car two equal to new car and uh, total price will be actually let's call this as uh, car price and now it will tell me to rename and it will rename all the references here like this and let's make this like this and car weight actually let's call this as price and this as weight okay so and the weight let's make this as 250 okay 2500 actually and this is the price okay so then uh, let's make car plus car two equal to or let's make something like this car car three equal to car one plus car two okay you see this is not working because we don't have plus operator so we need to have an operator for plus sign and we are going to write an over, uh, we are going to write a operator overloading for this i think it may suggest us a solution so potential fixes nothing let's write write public uh, static 
Okay, it will return car type and the operator we are going to overload is plus here. And then it will take car B and car C, whatever we want. Okay. So it is still telling us that one of the parameters of binary operator must be containing type. Okay, so let's look for this. Um, error type oh it is asking this okay it's fine it is fine so what does this uh, going to do is actually we need to look for this not the other one okay implicit operator okay this is the operator like this interesting so here we are going to generate a car b equal to new car like this and d dot price equal to b dot price plus c dot price and then um, d dot uh, weight equal to b dot weight plus c dot wait and it will return d however still this is giving an error one of the parameters of a binary operator what does this mean in reality okay okay it says that it has to uh follow some certain uh rules but which rules hmm. okay so this is exactly that we are asking Oh, I see. Okay, so if we define it here and we take cars over here, what happens? Mm, no. This is not the reason. Car B, car C, it returns car and plus sign. One of the parameters of a binary operator must be the containing type. Okay, let's look the uh, example given here. Okay, this is box B and box C. However, <laughs> this is not working for us right now. And the reason is... Okay, the reason is interesting. Okay, so this is the correct formatting, but still we have a problem. I am not able to overload uh, uh, plus operator for car B and C. So this class box defined here. 
okay so we have to define this operator inside this class yeah i understand now like this yeah now it is working okay and so now we are uh, we have overloaded the class operator this is operator overloading and which over uh, which operator we are overloading we are operator overloading uh, binary operator class operator and then let's say i am typing uh, console.write line car3 okay so now i need to overload console write line as well to print it as i want and therefore i'm going to overload that as well public static void and how am i gonna overload it um, okay let's check it out uh, c sharp overload actually this will this may be overriding too but let me check it yeah this is override not overload now i am going to override console right line okay how do we do it method overloading let's try it like this and here i will take car c okay it says this class cannot be inherited and yeah i am not able to overwrite like this let's define a method name as this okay so this will be car dot right line you see and this is not exactly overriding so let me check it out overwrite also right line i wonder if this is possible so anyway let's use this so this will take car c and when i make it like this uh, it will be directly usable as an extension and now it says that it has to be inside the top class like here and this will be uh, extension this is method extension keyboard okay let's take the notes Okay, what is method over, uh, overloading how to overload plus sign for a custom plus what is method extension how to extend a method for a custom class okay now instead of um, console right line i will just use car3 dot right line okay however it is not available i know the reason because okay why why this is not available okay program dot right line this card oh 
So this is extending program right now. And program is our class and it says that extension method must be defined in a non-generic static class. Yeah, that is the reason. You see, you have to check the errors. So therefore, I need to add another class to here. As or uh, up, or up of the program class. I can do it like this as well, I think. Yeah, now it should appear. No. Let's add that another class because it is not under any class, and every method uh, in C sharp has to be under a class. Uh, therefore, global class, or let's say global methods. This will be a public static class, and it's under lecture uh, thirteen CMD. And now it should work here. But now it is saying that there is no car class. Therefore, I need to add using static program, uh, actually lecture 13 CMD dot program. Now it will see car and it says that program car is less accessible than method therefore let's check our probably class car why less accessible hmm. this is also public why it's less accessible okay now the right line is appearing so that message is probably incorrect they are both public and under lecture 13 T, uh, cmd so this will use console right line um c dot price okay let's uh, add a little formatting okay car price Okay, let's see that. See that price to string with and zero formatting, and then let's delete this. Let's add a top character for weight as see that way to string and zero let's add kilogram and dollar okay okay however let's compile maybe it is incorrect error message sometimes it happens no so it says incorrect accessibility Maybe since because this is not oh this is not public yeah that is the reason now it will be accessible you see when I make the program class accessible it becomes accessible and no more errors so here it will work okay let's check it out so we have done method overriding and we haven't done method overloading yet we, we did method extension now it is working and now uh, we need to make method overloading too so for method overloading let's uh, define some internal methods of car class such as public mm, let's say uh, 
let's uh, add a good overloading example and how to make it i'm thinking about that okay i will make it like this so you see uh, this is method extension and let's define two other methods here as take double this will take car c as a parameter and there will be another actually let's say multiply car and then there will be another method this will be car c and car d public static car by the way and this is the public static car as well and this will take car c instead of car c and d i will take i enumerable car class list okay and this will return a new car okay and the price will be equal to c dot price multiply with d dot price price and the weight will be okay c dot weight multiply with d dot weight okay and this will uh, be a little bit different car new car will be okay equal to okay new car and here what we are going to do is we are going to enumerate this car list by the way when i am defining this uh, i will assign two values by default they are null therefore okay when we define nirv car we need to set some initial values as price equal to one and weight equal to one okay and this will be a car actually we are car in the list and maybe you wonder what uh, what is the difference between i enumerable and enumerable okay okay so it is asked as difference between i enumerable and enumerable i enumerable and enumerable class implements the i enumerable interface the i enumerable interface has only one method get enumerator which returns an i enumerator interface i enumerable is an interface it is part of system.collection namespace and it has one method, get enumerator. This is the method the for each loop uses loop through a collection and returns an i enumerator interface. An enumerable class is part of link library and is a bunch of extension methods written for the i enumerable interface. It has many extension methods like first, first or default, any, last, last or default, max, sum, average, etc. Okay, so actually we should use enumerable instead of i enumerable, and but now it will tell me to okay use link queue and to use link queue I have to install package because because it is not available by default. So I am adding link queue package right now. You see system dot link queue and now okay why it is not available okay if what if if we make it i enumerable can we make it as some yeah it is working here yeah, yeah we don't even need for each because obviously i enumerable is supporting link queue okay yeah fine 
and it will just return a new car as price equal to selecting prices of the list like this and weight will be equal to list dot okay sum you see uh, link q is how much making our life easier with our universal interface okay so this is method overloading you see they are exactly same method you see their return type is same their name is same however the parameters the signature they take is different the signature of uh, first method is the signature of first method is car and car however the signature of the second method is of the second method is an i uh, enumerable uh, okay object therefore they are different okay this is method overloading okay and now uh, i am going to show you how they would work from global methods that uh, right line or not right line uh, multiply car okay var we are car one equal to and then let's add let's make it like this okay car one and car two then let's make another car as we are car two which will take if i enumerable or list we can make it as list as well and we can even make it as uh, array we are car one car one car two uh, car three car one car two whatever we want then uh, we will use right line our method before doing that let's add console right line uh, it will write empty line and here I will use right line as okay let's also make an overload for right line here so this takes car C and then let's add string addition and by default I will make it null so um we will append it to the beginning like this since it will be null i think it will automatically handle it uh, by the console right line so here i will tell at an addition as car3 right line and here uh, car3 like this and for this one or actually this will be vr car1 yeah we are car one and we are car true so we are doing uh, a method uh, overloading here okay so we are car one car price is this and this this okay so you see uh, this is not exactly uh, the thing we wanted to see because we were expecting a multiply here but we did a summarization instead of a multiplication so how do we how can we multiply it i don't know if it does a multiply method probably no okay so what we need to do is we need to select price Hmm. okay <laughs> sorry about that link q multiply all values in a list <coughs> Sorry about that. 
Okay, so let's see if it is possible. Okay, so it is aggregate, uh, aggregate function. Let's read what it is. Okay, sorry about that. Oh. The aggregate function takes in an initial accumulator value and then applies an operation to every value in the enumeration creating a new accumulator value. Here we start with 1 and then multiply ever value by the current value of the accumulator. Note, in the case of an empty INT's value this will return 1. This may... Okay, so let's use uh, aggregate uh, method. And let's see what does it do. So the aggregate method will take, we will start from zero, applies an accumulated function over second. So it will summarize whatever there is, and it will take here that no. If and I, hmm, how can we do it? So here's no. okay. Maybe we can apply it like select PR dot PR price. Then we can use aggregate as zero and x and i and okay so where is we are making an error mistake x plus i x multiply i cannot implicitly convert type long to int so I have to make this long. To do that, I need to add no, not f but l. So this means that this is long. Okay. And um, it says the confused with digit one use as for clarity. So this is how we define long uh, numbers. Wait, L. Okay. Good. And what is aggregate method? All right. And we will apply the same for uh, weight. So I'm just doing the copy paste. Okay, so the weight will be equal to, okay. So what is this, if you wonder? This means that it will uh, multiply all values and it will add them to do this. Okay, I'm not sure if it will work like that. Let's try it. Okay, it is zero. So it is just aggregating with it. I mean, it's multiplying with that. So first it will take X as one, then Y as another value. And yes, it, it should work this way. Okay, so it has become too bigger long. Therefore they have become a, a negative value. So let's try, um, something easier so we are car one and let's multiply it we are car one let's try what happens okay so the car weight is correct uh, it is multiplication of this let's do it okay and this yeah however it was too big for 
car price so let's make our numbers a little bit uh, smaller like 10 or 5 and 7 and let's make it 2 and 3 and 3 and 4 and now we can see it if it's working or not okay so the car one is six uh i mean the vr car one and car two is 12. so we have multiplied it three times let's check it out okay and then this okay 1728 as you can see and let's see the price six six and six yes it is working as expected as we wanted and this is what is a um, method overloading okay so this is method overloading this is a uh, method extension and uh, this is method overriding actually this is more like operator overloading yeah and did we make a method overriding example no let's also make a method overriding example we haven't done that yet so let's also make an example of method overriding let's first take notes of this Method. what is method overloading and how to okay method overloading on a custom class method okay what is method overloading um operator overloading and how to actually we have uh written this This is met uh, operator overriding operator. Okay. This is an operator overriding. Okay. yeah this is correct and now we are at the method overriding yeah let's see method overriding method overriding in c sharp is similar to the virtual function in c plus plus method overriding is a technique that allows the invoking of functions from another class base class in the derived class Creating a method in the derived class with the same signature as a method in the base class is called as method overriding. Okay, so this is uh, the topic of the next semester in object-oriented programming. However, I will uh, show you an example, a simple example of that uh, quickly. So here we have a car class, right? Here. Now I am going to inherit car class with uh, such as trucks and it will inherit car class like this okay public class trucks so this will have all the public methods and properties of this uh, class let's also add a method here as let's say public static void um, print uh, car and this will print such as console right line okay car price equal to we already have this but just for illustration purposes i am making a simple example this dot actually it will just it can um, directly access the price parameters However, I have to make this not static to access its uh, instances. 
and then like this car weight okay like this wait okay so i want to overwrite this method how am i gonna do that i'm gonna do that with uh something like this public override public override void print car okay and then do we overwrite it okay um we have to first mark this as virtual now i can override it and the overrided method will be as car price with bigger letters and also let's add format okay so basically uh, now uh, this will use this method instead of this method call when we define an instance of uh, truck such as trucks how do we how did we define it okay t equal to like we are car two and it says it cannot implicitly convert because it is the inheriting class therefore let's try it like this and then i will just use um print car here and before doing that i will use print car here and just before that let's type okay car class print print like this and then truck class print since uh, this is inherited class child class it should work Oh, unable to cast car to type crowd trucks. So it didn't work as expected. Maybe uh, I can do this like this. I'm not sure if it will work. As trucks. Probably it will yield the same result, but oh now it has returned no therefore it didn't work mm. how to get base class instance from driver class oh maybe like this yeah yeah let's try that will be equal to new trucks and it will take okay we are car two however probably i need to write and methods overloading for this a constructor so let's add a constructor here as public trucks which takes instance of car car d like this and this dot price will be equal to uh, okay d dot price and this dot width will be equal to d dot weight yeah now it will work and yeah now it is working okay let's rerun the application okay so the truck class print car is like this price this and car weight is this and car price is uh okay we have some 
Car class print. Where it is? Car class print. Car class. Okay, so in the print car we have right line, but let's add some new lines because now uh, it is a little bit confusing. Yeah, I know the reason. Yeah, yeah, now I get it. We have to use this. Okay, and like this and right line like this now it will be better formatted and easier to understand okay so the car class print is printed like this and the truck class print printed like this so this is method overriding you can override a method if it is marked as uh, i think virtual and let's see Are there any way? Okay, so uh, this is uh, enough to know right now uh, because we will see more details about this topic in the next semester, as I said, and how to overwrite a method marked as virtual in the parent class this is rather topic of the next semester in object oriented but we are having just an idea right now okay now we uh, we also have seen value and reference type so let's remove this as well and yeah now time for anonymous and dynamic types these are really important. So let's start with anonymous type first. Okay. This is really important to understand. Let's read it in uh, original. Anonymous types provide a convenient way to encapsulate a set of read-only properties into a single object without having to explicitly define a type first. The type name is generated by the compiler and is not available at the source code level. The type of each property is inferred by the compiler. You create anonymous types by using the new operator together with an object initializer. For more information about object initializers, see object and collection initializers. Okay, so here there is an example as var v equal to name amount and message hello and console write like this. Anonymous types typically are used in the select clause of a query expression to return a subset of the properties from each object in the source sequence. For more information about queries, see LINQ and C Sharp. Anonymous types contain one or more public read only properties. No other kinds of class members, such as methods or events, are valid. The expression that is used to initialize a property cannot be null, an anonymous function, or a pointer type. The most common scenario is to initialize an anonymous type with properties from another type. In the following example, Assume that a class exists that is named product. Class product includes color and price properties, together with other properties that you are not interested in. Variable products is a collection of product objects. The anonymous type declaration starts with the new keyword. The declaration initializes a new type that uses only two properties from product. Actually, we have seen this when we were working with entity framework selection query. Uh, so here there is an, also an example like this from product and things and there is no full full example maybe there is a better example uh, on here so they are starting with new keyboard only and then we can use them like this 
Okay, so there is an there is an example here. First, let me take this into the part two. Okay, now let's uh, test this code. So you see, this is anonymous type A, you see. And it takes ID, so ID is being integer. However, I can make this long as well, or I can make this double as well, like this. So it will be automatically understood by the compiler. Then we will be able to write line them. However, this will give me an error because you cannot change value of an anonymous type. So they are read only. Okay, so this is what is anonymous type. Okay, um, anonymous types. Okay, anonymous uh, objects are read only. Okay, so let's output and they are printed. Okay, so are there anything that we need to know? There can be also a nested anonymous type like this. Here we have ID, first name, last name, and address. This is also another anonymous type. And it says there is always a student, so we can make this like this. So you see this is an, being an anonymous type. Normally we would we have to define a cl class, a custom class for to define this. However, um, now uh, we can define it like this with uh, read only properties as an anonymous type so student 2 dot for example address okay dot uh, city i can access it like this let's see and it is here so this is a nested anonymous type okay nested anonymous type object and any other important thing okay this is also important to read an anonymous type will always be local to the method where it is defined it cannot be returned from the method however an anonymous type can be passed to the method as object type parameter but it is not recommended if you need to pass it to another method then use struct or class instead of an anonymous type. So if you are going to pass an instance of anonymous type, you should use struct or class, not anonymous type. Okay. Mostly, anonymous types are created using the select clause of a linq queries to return a subset of the properties from each object in the collection. Okay, so there is a good example uh, to illustrate this. So we have public class um student like this let's give this a new name oh we don't need a new name and then we can use to select subset a subset like this so we have uh, an i list of student list and it has uh, five students like this then we are going to select sub list of students like this from the student list and it says that select is not found i know because i need to add link you okay system dot link you now it will be working here you see it is selecting a new subset with anonymous type like this so we are getting only 13 values out of a list this would be very useful when we are working with entity framework and database tables let's say i only want to select two uh, uh, columns of a table and i can select it as a new anonymous type like this okay so let's run the application and see so it prints them like this so basically we have selected only two only two columns out of a table for example uh, like here uh, otherwise this wouldn't be possible uh, 
to handle it this easy we would be needed to uh, code custom classes method overloadings or such but with anonymous types we can uh, select a subset of a collection okay uh, let's take a note here okay anonymous type objects are most commonly used to select a subset of a collection like blue okay this was a great example and yeah let's read this in the above example a select clause in the LINQ query selects only student ID and student name properties and renames it to ID and name, respectively. Thus, it is useful in saving memory and unnecessary code. The query result collection includes only student ID and student name properties, as shown in the following debug view. Visual Studio supports IntelliSense for anonymous types, as shown below. This is great, you see, uh, that is why I like the most Visual Studio for developing applications. Its IntelliSense is great. I don't know if this is possible in other uh, IDAs, Integrated Development Environments. Okay, and we can also give a custom name. You see, like ID or name of the uh, selected parameter and we can directly access them like this. It is all done with IntelliSense and it will be checked at the compile time. You see, now I am getting an error. Therefore, it prevents me to compile uh, with erroneous code. It is great, believe me. And uh, now there is dynamic types and generics. We haven't come to generics yet. But before delving into generics, let's remember the difference between structs and classes okay because structs are also important uh, part of programming development structs are light versions of classes structs are value types and can be used to create objects that behave like built-in types this is important. Normally, uh, when we copy uh, reference types, they just copy their pointer. What I mean is student list two equal to student list. Okay. Then um, I will write line. Uh, I will change to uh, an element of student list two, for example. Uh, the second index dot h equal to 100 okay then i will write line okay student uh, list one okay index two h equal to okay h and uh, the other object student list two okay index two h equal to okay this is also the to topic of uh, object oriented programming but let's just have, <coughs> have an idea so normally uh, it was age uh, 18 i uh, assigned it a new student list like this a new uh, object and i changed the student list to age so what do you expect to be printed 18 and 100 no it will be both 100 because this simply this simply uh, copy the pointer of a uh, student list into the uh, student list uh, to object so they point to the same values whatever change we made on values will be uh, reflected to the both objects 
because uh, they point to the same values okay they are just they are just memory addresses okay like a street address so let's run the application okay they are both 100 so this is where struct make difference let me show you i will define a public struct and st student okay so in here we will have some properties as public int irh and let's have student name okay prof okay and student name like this now i will compose two instances of st student student one will be equal to nil student and let's set its values as 21 and name okay test student okay like this then i will generate another student st student okay student two it will be equal to student one okay and now actually let's make them like this okay set st student one and st student two like this okay now i will change the value of uh, st student two okay like h equal to 100 then i will uh, right line them okay let's see if there will be any difference okay st student one uh, h equal to okay, r h and st student two okay uh, h equal to st student two i r h now what do we expect to see let's run the application to see the difference you see 21 and 100 now it is behaving like a value type this is the difference also this struct is being kept in uh, 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 what was it let me remember in here instead of stack that is also difference okay probably i'm not sure what probably it is kept in heap or stuff let me check it okay maybe it is written here as well let's continue reading structs share many features with classes but with the following limitations as compared to classes struct cannot have a default constructor a constructor without parameters or a destructor so struct cannot have a constructor like this a public struct and no okay it says that structs cannot contain explicit parameterless constructors okay so uh, we need to have like irs uh, okay and then i have to set it r1 and sr equal to sr2 like this let's see yeah so it has to be parameterable okay uh if if uh, we don't make that it won't work so i wonder if this would work let me check something we will leave student does this work yeah okay so this is working and this is one uh, uh, example there are also destructors let's also uh, learn that what is that 
structs are value types and are copied on assignment. This is really important. If you want something values to be copied over assignment, you have to use struct, not classes. Okay, this is a key issue. So here we are using an assignment and this is copying values. Okay, it is not just copying reference. This is copying values since it is struct type on uh, classes it just copies reference okay not the values values and let's continue structs are value types while classes are reference types yes structs can be instantiated without using a new operator okay. a struct cannot inherit from another struct or class and it cannot be the base of a class so it cannot be inherited all structs inherit directly from system dot value type which inherits from system object struct cannot be a base class so struct types cannot abstract and are always implicitly sealed abstract and se uh, sealed class is also topic of next semester in object oriented programming Abstract and sealed modifiers are not allowed and struct member cannot be protected or protected internals. Function members in a struct cannot be abstract or virtual, and the override modifier is allowed only to the override methods inherited from system.value type. Struct does not allow the instance field declarations to include variable initializers. But static fields of a struct are allowed to include variable initializers. A struct can implement interfaces. A struct can be used as a nullable type and can be assigned a null value. Okay, so the question comes when to use struct or classes. If you can use struct and solve your problem, you should use struct because structs are much more lightweight and harder to make mistakes since it just copies the values. It is not reference types. Okay, so what is struct? Uh, how to use structs? What are the differences between struct and class objects? Okay, when to use when to use struct or a class? A class when to use a struct or a class? Okay, let's see the example uh, the differences oh, sorry about that when to use struct or classes to answer this question we should have a good understanding of the differences s.n struct classes 1. Structs are value types allocated either on the stack or inline in containing types. So they are allocated on stack, not on heap and or inline containing types. I don't know what does this mean actually. Classes are reference types allocated on the heap and garbage collected. So this is important. They are garbage collected and what kind of problem this may cause to us i'm not sure let's continue allocations and deallocations of value types are in general cheaper than allocations and deallocations of reference types so they are lighter weight as you can see assignments of large reference types are cheaper than assignments of large value types so if your object is very large then reference types are cheaper as in assignments because they just assigned to pointers not copy the values in structs each variable contains its own copy of the data except in the case of the ref and out parameter variables and an operation on one variable does not affect another variable okay in classes two variables can contain the reference of the same object and any operation on one variable can affect another variable yeah, we have shown that already and continue. S dot N. Okay, sorry about that. We should start here. S dot N. Okay.
S.N. It's not working interesting. S.N. Okay. Why it is not working? S.N. Anyway, let me read it. In this way, struct should be used only when you are sure that it logically represents a single value like perimeter types, int, double, etc. It is immutable. Immutable means that when you change it or copy it, it will always generate a new instance. Okay. So it is. it may be ex expensive. It should not be boxed and unboxed frequently. Uh, so this is probably harder as well. And a stack example is given here. Okay. Personally, I would suggest you to use struct if you can solve your problem with that. Uh, because I think it is harder to make mistakes. It is lighter weight. And let's... Uh, look for some uh, comparison let's say garbage collection memory usage comparison c sharp Okay, so there's coding for performance struct versus classes. I think this is an article. Let's read it. Instances of a class are always allocated on the heap and accessed via a pointer to reference. Passing them around is cheap because it is just a copy of the pointer, 4 or 8 bytes. However, an object also has some fixed overhead. 8 bytes for 32-bit processes and 16 bytes for 64-bit processes. This overhead includes the pointer to the method table and a sync block field that is used for multiple purposes. However, if you examined an object that had no fields in the debugger, you would see that the size is reported as 12 bytes, 32-bit, or 24 bytes, 64-bit. Why is that? .NET will align all objects in memory, and these are the effective minimum object sizes. A struct has no overhead at all, and its memory usage is a sum of the size of all its fields. If a struct is declared as a local variable in a method, then the struct is allocated on the stack. Okay, this is important. So when we define a struct inside a local variable in a method, it will be allocated on the stack. Okay. Uh, such as, let's make an example of that. For example, um, inside, let's find a method. Okay, that we have coded. Like here. Okay, so for example, I define a struct here as test. It has something like this um but this is not the inline struct actually i think this means that instance of a struct yeah yeah so if i define an instance of a struct such as okay what was our struct name it was student like this pg equal to new student this will be allocated on heap okay because it will alive only for the duration of print car method execution it will be therefore allocated on stack yeah not heap uh, i just uh, said incorrectly stack if the struct is declared as part of a class then the struct's memory will be part of that class's memory layout and thus exist on the heap. When you pass a struct to a method, it is copied byte for byte. Because it is not on the heap, allocating a struct will never cause a garbage collection. Yeah, this is what it is. So stack is managed. Stack is not managed by garbage collection. I think it is managed by a CLR. Let's check it. Okay, stack is managed by what if not garbage 
and lecture these are all advanced stuff by the way okay anyway i won't delve into that this is more uh, advanced stuff there is thus a trade-off here you can find various pieces of advice about the maximum recommended size of a struct but i would not get caught up on the exact number in most cases you will want to keep struct sizes very small especially if they are passed around but you can also pass structs by reference so the size may not be an important issue to you so if you pass them as a reference then it won't be it won't generate a new instance it will be behaved like a class instance okay uh, this is also uh, the topic of next semester uh, so don't worry about that i think i will just take a note to my um, previous semesters here and here object oriented okay not inside from push okay explain in details why and I'm not sure, maybe I have shown that, but I don't remember right now. If I didn't show in the previous semester. The only way to know for sure whether it benefits you is to consider your usage pattern and do your own profiling. Okay, so if you are passing a lot of uh, objects between methods, uh, then uh, you may need to have class instance, or if you don't need, you may need to have struct instance. You will understand this better as you get more professional on c -sharp programming believe me that so let's also see the constructor what is the constructor we already have we already know constructor so let's see the constructor as well the structure actually not that not the constructor Finalizers, which are also called destructors, are used to perform any necessary final cleanup when a class instance is being collected by the garbage collector. Remarks Finalizers cannot be defined in structs. They are only used with classes. A class can only have one finalizer. Finalizers cannot be inherited or overloaded. Finalizers cannot be called. They are invoked automatically. A finalizer does not take modifiers or have parameters. Okay, like this, for example. Yeah, let's uh, write a finalizer and see what is happening. So for my uh, ST student, not OG the stuff, we can't define a finalizer there. For my CS temp, yeah. I will define a finalizer like this, CS temp. So this will be a finalizer. They cannot take any parameters. So they will be like this. And console right line. Okay. Uh, this uh, CS temp object. Uh, okay. Is being garbage collected. But uh, okay. So this is a finalizer. This is a finalizer or as known as uh, the structures let's run the application uh, currently do we call it no let's just call it somewhere here i will call it here pg equal to new yes time and that's it yeah and then i will set it to null here this and see what happens okay so you see we didn't see the print message because uh it didn't take time uh it didn't uh actually the program didn't run enough to garbage collect so let's call 
GC collect. Okay. Now let's see what happens before the application ends. Okay, we still don't see it. So let's add some while, um, while loop here as system not training that sleep. So the application won't end. Let's see now what happens. Okay, it says that while true, yeah. So the application will never end. Okay, still we don't see garbage collection. This is an inline method. We are already seeing that. Okay, but why we didn't see the message? Maybe we need to use garbage collector any everywhere. So this is the finalizer or not? Yeah, it is the finalizer. Okay, so we are collecting garbage collecting, but it is not getting finalized. Interesting. Okay, so what? Why do we need to use that? Okay. The programmer has no control over when the finalizer is called. The garbage collector decides when to call it. The garbage collector checks for objects that are no longer being used by the application. If it considers an object eligible for finalization, it calls the finalizer, if any, and reclaims the memory used to store the object. In .NET Framework applications, but not in .NET Core applications, finalizers are also called when the program exits. It's possible to force garbage collection by calling collect, but most of the time, this call should be avoided because it may create performance issues. Okay, so I have another idea to trigger it. Let me show you. Okay, so instead of this, uh, I will just generate an instance of this class, like this, and let's also assign a value to it so this class have peak definition my property yeah so my property well, and all i also need to initialize it like this equal to something like this and something like this so let's see what happens now after a while it has to collect a garbage collector because it will become too big and then we should be see that let's see how much memory we are taking oh we are still too slow so let's increase the speed with one millisecond and let's check the memory okay we are still not much using memory so it is still not Calling garbage collector. Yeah, the memory is not increasing. So let's remove trading sleep and let's run the application. I hope it won't crash. Yeah, yeah, I just saw that. Okay, here you see it is being garbage collected. Now we have triggered the garbage collector because it did just fill it the memory instantly uh, yeah okay so we have seen uh, the structure of finalizer 
and how can it use it what is class finalizer also call it as reference okay destroyer or destructor or i'm a destroyer all right and now uh dynamic types okay now uh time to see dynamic types and then generic types okay let's get an example of dynamic types okay c sharp dynamic types c sharp 4.0 .NET 4.5 introduced a new type called dynamic that avoids compile time type checking. A dynamic type escapes type checking at compile time, instead, it resolves type at runtime. A dynamic type variables are defined using the dynamic keyword. Okay, an example is like this. The compiler compiles dynamic types into object types in most cases. However, the actual type of a dynamic variable dynamic type variable would be result at dynamic type okay something like this let's check it out so first um, I will get this into part 3 right point But since we made this, oh, we didn't make it. So let's also change this to for loop with like something like this. I don't know, this should be enough. So it won't be forever. Let's make it like this and let's run to see if it is working oh it didn't, we didn't call it yeah Okay, it's working. Let's close it. And now time to uh, make example of dynamic type. Like this dynamic, however, it will be resolved to integer. So I will also show another example as this. And let's see that. okay so the first one will be integer and the second one is long okay we can also directly uh, type them like this okay to string or oh, it can't be typed as to string so it will be dynamically result okay, let's make this something like this and this something like this okay they are typed okay let's continue dynamic types change types at runtime based on the assigned value the following example shows how a dynamic variable changes type based on assigned value okay so you see dynamic type can change uh, value at runtime like this so with a single variable name we are able to get different types of values uh, like this let's run the application you see 
first it becomes integer then it becomes string then it becomes boolean and then it becomes date type okay the dynamic type variables is converted to other types implicitly like here okay methods and parameters if you assign a class object to the dynamic type then the compiler would not check for correct methods and properties name of a dynamic type that holds the custom class object. Consider the following example. Okay, so we have public class student. We already have this, so I need to change this to a uh, student X. Okay. And let's define an example. Like dynamic student X, like this and then okay so there is no such thing because uh, it is not checking it run uh, compile time uh, it will throw, uh, throw compile uh, runtime error why because uh, it doesn't have a method that includes uh, it, uh, the class doesn't have this name it method actually it has this name it method but it doesn't have method that takes uh, integer and c uh, string signature or string signature or some fake method so they will throw error in runtime so you see using dynamic types is a little bit of dangerous because no compile time checking okay In the above example, the C# -sharp compiler does not check for the number of parameters, parameters type, or non-existent. It validates these things at runtime, and if it is not valid, then throws a runtime exception. Note that Visual Studio IntelliSense is not supported for the dynamic types. Note that Visual Studio IntelliSense. Okay, it is double time. So when we should use dynamic types? When use dynamic type in C#? -sharp? let's see when should we use it but why we should use it Okay, so let's read this answer. Dynamic should be used only when not using it is painful. Like in MS Office libraries. In all other cases it should be avoided as compile type checking is beneficial. Following are the good situation of using dynamic. Calling JavaScript method from Silverlight. Com interop. Maybe reading XML, JSON without creating custom classes. Okay. Okay, so there is a good example here. Like we have some interface is SAM data. Then we have two classes which uh, uses this as interface. Then we have some do something. So based on the case, uh, we can use dynamic. Uh, this is a really wild example. Uh, without so much specification
okay this is rather an advanced topic as you become more expert in uh, c sharp you will understand it better so you should avoid using dynamic for now dynamic type objects and how to use dynamic type okay now we get into generics it is really important and it is very common to use it generics okay so generics is really important therefore you should pay more attention to this c sharp generics generic means the general form not specific in c sharp generic means not specific to a particular data type yeah this is the answer it is not specific to a particular data type so it can be used with multiple different types okay c sharp allows you to define generic classes interfaces abstract classes fields methods static methods properties events delegates and operators using the type parameter and without the specific data type a type parameter is a placeholder for a particular type specified when creating an instance of the generic type a generic type is declared by specifying a type parameter in an angle brackets after a type name e.g type name t where t is a type parameter okay so uh, let's make a an easy example so let's take this into part four okay so let's assume that we want to generate uh, a method that can multiply uh, different uh, value types okay so public um, static t it will return t uh, multiply uh, okay it will take this dot t actually to make it uh, like this i have to use it like this No. T dot. I think I need to add generics or something, perhaps. No generics. So let's see. Okay, one moment. Okay, let's see, does it support me anything? So where do we make oh I see to be able to define a public uh, method like this we have to define a class first public class I just remembered that so it will be like this t and inside this class we can use uh, a method like that so public class let's say um, custom class or let's say custom class and it will be type of t like this and then uh, we can have a multiply like this yeah yeah now it will work so what will this do is it will just uh, return value and value like this yeah okay so okay there is no operator like that so what else can we do
we need operator overloading for this probably but since this is uh, generic i have to tell that this operand is supported so i need to uh, add a constraint to this okay um let me check that i think okay c sharp value type constraint to generic i can't remember the constraint so there is var keyboard yeah var how we see how about the do okay var t var t equal to struct or value type maybe no maybe value type value type no maybe value type now does it support no maybe we can tell integers double like this no Yeah, maybe we need to employ this where t system i comparable system dot multipliable i don't know um, Uh, multiply operator supported type C sharp. Okay, huh? Okay, someone has asked that. So, what is the constraint for that? Is integral? Yeah, integral. It means that it will be a number and now for integral now i arithmetic maybe okay so no maybe i equitable this may be also an answer Uh, okay, so why do we still have I equitable? Okay, still not this. There is no current support in .NET generics to indicate that operators are supported. Oh, okay, I see. So this is not supported. We have started with a, some uh, harder examples. So let's follow uh, the article here, I think. So let's start with the class store T. Okay, just ignore this. So class store T means that there is a class which takes any type type and it has that type of data okay so uh, let's continue reading above the data store is a generic class t is called type parameter which can be used as a type of fields properties method parameters return types and delegates in the data store class for example, data is generic property because we have used a type parameter T as its type instead of the specific data type.
It is not required to use T as a type parameter. You can give any name to a type parameter. Generally, T is used when there is only one type parameter. It is recommended to use a more readable type parameter name as per requirement like T session, T key, T value, etc. Learn more about type parameter naming guidelines. Okay, so we can also uh, generate another uh, class like this. Key value appear, T key, T value, so it can be anything. Actually, this is the generic T value key. And now let's initiate instance, uh, instantiate a generic class, generic uh, type class. So you see, this is data store, but it is from string type. So that now this class can hold data as string, such as, okay, such example. Then I can use console write line to print that as store dot data. Okay, since it is string type, it will work. Okay, however, once we define it, it's type, then we can change its type like this uh, because it will tell, tell me that uh, cannot convert type integer to string. Therefore, you cannot change its type once it is defined. So this is how we define it, it. You can create an instance of generic classes by specifying an actual type in angle brackets. The following creates an instance of the generic class data store. Like this, and let's continue. Above, we specified the string type in the angle brackets while creating an instance. So T will be replaced with a string type wherever T is used in the entire class at compile time. Therefore, the type of data property would be a string. So you see it is, com it is uh, converted at the compile time, therefore it is compile time. Check it and verify it. It is not like dynamic. You can assign a string value to the data property. Trying to assign values other than string will result in a compile time error. Yeah, this will uh, throw an error. So let's also add this. Okay. You can specify the different data types for different objects as shown below. So you see with single uh, class, we are able to define different types of objects like this. Data store string, data store integer, data store key, uh, key value pair integer string, key value pair string string, whatever we want. We can define uh, different types of objects with generics like this. Okay, here it is storing they are all data store class, but different types as you can see. Okay. Generic class characteristics. A generic class increases the reusability. The more type parameters mean more reusable it becomes. However, too much generalization makes code difficult to understand and maintain. Definitely true. A generic class can be a base class to other generic or non-generic classes or abstract classes. A generic class can be derived from other generic or non-generic interfaces, classes, or abstract classes. Okay, we will learn more about abstraction interfaces or um, inheritance. Uh, at the next semester uh, in object-oriented programming. Generic fields. A generic class can include generic fields. However, it cannot be initialized. Also, generic methods are always defined inside generic uh, classes. Uh, that's important. So we can have generic array as well, like this, the generic array. So it will hold data type of T like this. For example, um, data store. 
and the type will be let's say long okay uh, ld data nil data store long and inside here i can define data as by the way let's give different names as data array data will be something like this and the data array will be nil um long like this okay. and this will initialize it with i think since this is array i have to um define it like this sorry about that it's gonna be like this yeah and uh, now uh, i can print to the screen uh, the data array of ld data uh right line item it will print this to the screen you see it is generic type in other case this can be string or object whatever i want because it is a generic type and then we can have generic methods. Generic methods. A method declared with the type parameters for its return type or parameters is called a generic method. Like this, add or update. So it inserts an item to the uh, list or returns an item from list like this. So add or update field as data to let's also define an, another instance of data. This will be private, so won't be accessible by uh, other methods or classes. Private t data, and now I can add or update like add or update. It requires an index and a long item. By the way, when we don't have such index, what is it going to do? Oh, since it is array, it can directly uh, assign data. Then we can also use get data as well. To get data, we just use get data and index like this. Okay. and we are data okay it is working so this is generic method above the adder update and the get data methods are generic methods the actual data type of the item parameter will be specified at the time of instantiating the data store t class as shown below okay so let's continue the generic parameter type can be used with multiple parameters with or without non-generic parameters and return type the followings are valid generic method overloading yeah let's copy and paste them into our class okay like here so you can mix strong type uh strong type it uh, with generic type like editor update index t data we already have that so we have to remove it and these are other overloaded so generic generic or uh, this means that one generic and another generic different like this or this okay so now it says that it is ambiguous with uh, this or this therefore what can we do yeah this is being ambiguous therefore we need to change um, which one 
okay for example this will be integer and this will be long then it will work yeah you see since it is checking at compile time uh, this will get into this why because the, this one takes in intent uh, long i mean generic yeah yeah this will get into this and if i make it something like this let me show you what i mean so console write line okay first add or update and here okay second add or update and here third add or update so uh, this will call uh, the first this will call first add or update and now i will change this to object uh, double this will call uh, second other update but why not working oh they have to be from same type so let's make it something like this t type and t type T type T type. Oh, I know the reason since we have defined it here as long, so they have to both long like this and this. I don't even need to put the second one. To, oh, I need to put probably. And then uh, let's make another instance for third. So this will take another type like double so now it will expect me first long and the second one will be double like this this will call the third okay let's run the application to see first error update second error update and third error update and this is how you can mix different type of generics yeah it's already displayed here so the console right line also supports generic as well and therefore this is valid let's also add it to our example like here a printer class and different type of prints Oh, I have put this in correct place. It will be inside here. You see, first it will print integer, then it will print integer, then it will print string, then it will print string. Okay, uh, both of them will work because it has this kind of print method. Okay, so both are of both of them is working. Advantages of generics Generics increase the reusability of the code. You don't need to write code to handle different data types. Generics are type safe. You get compile time errors if you try to use a different data type than the one specified in the definition. Generic has a performance advantage because it removes the possibilities of boxing and unboxing. Okay, uh, what are generics? How to define generics using classes and methods? What are the advantages of generics? Uh, how to restrict generics? Now we are going to use a uh, restriction of generics. I'm in the constraint how to let's take generics with constraints okay so now uh, let's make constraint of generics okay 
okay so let's start with an easy one okay so let's start with an easy uh, one data store 2 okay i'm going to use data store 2 okay v2 actually so i'm going to add a constraint as var uh, var t is integer and double so here we can only define data store to with integer and double oh by the way it doesn't allow value types to be constrained therefore it's it's it has to be interface a non seeded class or a type parameter so then we can i think constrain it into value type like this and well it doesn't support value type as well let's constrain it to value a tuple no not working either system dot i enumerable maybe okay let's make it system dot enum yeah now data store two can be only enum okay so data store two version two let's pick an enum like uh, console color yeah my colors it will be like this this console color and enumeration type yes so here i have defined a type of console color then uh, i can set console color data to like this then let's define another enumeration so can i define my data store to like this now no because it will tell me that the type string cannot be used as type parameter t in the generic type or method there is no implicit in reference conversation from string to system enum so it has to be either implicitly convertible or enumeration this will throw compiler error so you can restrict your enumeration to uh, certain classes like it will be either system enum or my cs temp class okay so now it will be allowed as well okay so it says that it has to come first like this mm. How do we set multiple constraints then? I see. So it is like this where T C S temp and where T system and and we put it like this okay oh no no this is wrong so how do you put multiple constraints okay base class name no 
why we can set it like this okay so we can't set it like both enumeration and another class it doesn't allow uh, so it can be either enum type or my custom class type like this and this can be version 3 so it would only allow this or this wouldn't be very useful of course it would instead of this we would define it as CSTAM so let's try as I enumerable okay this is more uh, sense making and now let's try a string so it is expecting I enumerable okay dt3 like this and it will okay you see it is working because string is enumerable as character and let's try it, it as uh, integer this is not enumerable obviously so this will throw compile time error because it says cannot implicitly convert type uh, string to um, okay there is no boxing conversation from integer to system collections i enumerable okay uh, this will throw compile time error and let's make another example as dt5 and let's define an enumerable like integer array okay this should work and now it is working as you can see okay i can also define it as list or even dictionary dictionary is also enumerable like string string like this dt6 and new data store you see since this is i enumerable then it is working all right so we have seen generics as well and in many methods we see generics such as console write line and it takes uh, no parameter boolean character character buffer decimal double float integer long object string u int u long uh, you see actually this doesn't inherit generic so let's try with list and list is you see getting t t is the type of the element so it is supporting generics or dictionary or tuple let's try for example tuple you see tuple is also supporting generics and or let's say array for example uh, but for array we have to define strong type so instead let's uh, say hash table for example hash set you see it is also generic so this is uh, what are generics and uh, where they are being used and you will see a lot of generics when you work with them so an example here okay let's also make this example so we have public static void uh, which takes t uh, parameter and where t is a class and it will just system console write line t equal equal t and then we have a method like this so first one is string and the second one is also string and it will write line if they are equal or not by the way even though this is not inside uh, another class it is working because we have defined t if we remove this 
it will tell us an error you see because it doesn't support just generic however when we restrict it to a class then we can use boolean operator because it supports class and now when we run the application since they are both string we can see the result as here all right and another thing so constraining multiple values like this and then some other operators like let's see sample class where t equal v t unmanaged delegate constraints and then constraint like this okay i think this is enough for uh, generics dynamics anonymous types okay okay not much left all right let's see params keyboard uh, for infinite uh, parameters okay so i'm going to put this into a new uh, method okay all right and then let's see parameters so okay private static void parameterized method and here it will take params parameters like this and this will be void and okay let's see values and arrows must be single dimension array let me check it yeah it has to be like this yes so okay i think this is a better example object list so you see params keyboard is being used uh, with a single dimensional array like this and it's this can be anything it can be string object or whatever we want so what uh, goodness this would uh, bring us what benefits for example let's assume that uh, this method will um sum all of the objects and then print them to the screen like this okay string builder i will use string builder i actually don't need that let's do this like that okay object um let's say sum okay will e equal to null then we will make sum plus equal to uh item inside list we are item like this and uh, i wonder if this is okay so this is not uh, accepted okay let's assume that we will uh, in inherently implicitly convert them to the double so double cannot be null therefore double dot let's say make it zero and then uh, we will convert this object into cast into double like this 
and then we will write the result so so all of these will work let me show you like one or let's say one uh, zero three and let's say uh, 33 and uh, like this or something like this uh, by the way these have to be convertible to double otherwise it would uh, cause an error so therefore we can make this as double and now uh, i think it should work because with s keyword it will return null oh it says double is non-nullable type therefore it is not working so maybe we can make it like this okay look at this nullable double no it didn't work okay so let's make it like this okay and it can be long integer float whatever we want like like this will be float and this will be long and whatever we wa we want so the long cannot be negative probably okay oh long cannot be like this yeah it, this can be float actually and so this is float this is also float and this can be long and we can add any number of, of elements here okay so this is what does params do okay and all of them will work let me show you oh we didn't we didn't output them to the screen yet so let's also code that okay so it says unable to cast object type of system input okay so we need to have explicit casting therefore let's make it like this temp and double try parse and we are item and then out dbr temp like this and it is asking it cannot convert object so this will be to string object that to string supports because string is nullable type and then we, we will just sum it like this and we will write line sum to string with an five for example let's run it okay you see they are printed on the screen uh, like this so this is what does parameterize it uh, do okay there is also another example here let's do that example okay uh, there is static void take value and then there are incoming values values like this and then we have value here it is object type and we can get type and name you see we are using console.write line and since it supports null, nullable objects therefore all of them will work and let's use it like this so you see i can send each kind of um, uh, different kinds of elements to the same method with different number of inputs like this so it will handle uh sitting it will handle a uh, double it will handle float okay like this and it will handle a uh, decimal like this and all of them will be printed on the screen let's see oh, one moment so let's rename this as value okay okay so you see value ten type is okay this is the type all right 
Okay, so the value is, for example, 10 type is in, uh, integer, value is 30 type of single, and there is type single, double, string, decimal, as you can see. So all of them is handled in with a uh, parameter, parameter, uh, params, uh, type object, and these have to be single uh, dimensional array. I think it doesn't support multi-dimensional here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's say any number of uh, input variables to a method with params object type. how to invoke a method with any number of input variables. By using... All right, and what else left? Class coupling metric, exception handling, we will show it later. Then we have delegates, events, and this. Okay, let's start with events. I think we, we already uh, seen that previously, but let's see it again. Okay, so in uh, for example, in uh, VPF application, we are we were binding events to the uh, such as buttons or list box or uh, other things. This is same actually. So for example, uh, we are going to compose. Uh, Event like this, event class. So let's put this inside part five. Like this, part six actually, not five. And then we are going to define a class and event. Okay, so what did we define? We have defined a delegate like a public delegate string. It takes a string. Then we have defined it a class event program. It has event type my del event, and then it has event program uh, constructor, the constructor of this class. It assigns my event with uh, event, uh, let's say overloading method plus equal to new my del, and it will take this welcome user and welcome user is a string like this. It will return welcome plus username and then uh, we will call uh, this event like this okay so i can access my event why because this is not public this has to be public to be accessible all right and Okay, where is the program? Do you have program menu? Oh, interesting. I also didn't like this example. It is not very much explaining. Maybe this example is better, yeah. So let's uh, remove this example. And let's see. So there is public delegate void notify. This is more sense making. And we have public class business logic. So we have public events notify here. So this is event, this is delegates. We have public voice start process. It says process started and on process completed. Okay, there is another uh, method called here. And it's a virtual void. And it will invoke process completed dot invoke. Okay, so let's uh, actually start reading because we won't understand without reading. C sharp events. An event is a notification sent by an object to signal the occurrence of an action. Okay, this is really important. So, what is event? 
An event is a notification sent by an object to signal occurrence of an action. Such as uh, when you receive an email, you get a, a push notification, right? So it is triggering event of push uh, notification when an email arrives your inbox. Okay, so this is like that. Events in .NET follow the observer design pattern. The class who raises events is called publisher, and the class who receives the notification is called subscriber. There can be multiple subscribers of a single event. Typically, a publisher raises an event when some action occurred. The subscribers who are interested in getting a notification when an action occurred should register with an event and handle it. In C Sharp, an event is an encapsulated delegate. It is dependent on the delegate. The delegate defines the signature for the event handler method of the subscriber class. So the delegate defines signature for the event handler method. So here, basically, we are uh, defining the signature, and the signature is empty, as you see. There is nothing it takes. Okay. And also, uh, it is void, therefore it doesn't return anything as well. So this is the signature. So there is an illustration and let's see the illustration in bigger size. So we have subscriber, subscribe event plus equal to event handler, subscriber events. And then there is the publisher. It has delegates. So event handler is bound to the delegate of the publisher and the publisher when an event occurs, it uh, notifies the subscriber and then subscriber can do anything when that event happens. Uh, so you see another subscriber can um, subscribe to the publisher as well. Okay. Declare an event. An event can be declared in two steps. Declare a delegate. Declare a variable of the delegate with event keyword. The following example shows how to declare an event in publisher class. So you see, we are declaring a delegate here and from the same name. So this is meaning that it is bound to this delegate. We define an event like this. So this is our delegate. You see, it shows delegate and you see this is bound to that delegate actually here. And this is the event itself. In the above example, we declared a delegate notify and then declared an event process completed of delegate type notify using event keyword in the process business logic class. Thus, the process business logic class is called the publisher. So it will call the publisher and we didn't call the publisher yet. The notify delegate specifies the signature for the process completed event handler. It specifies that the event handler method in subscriber class must have a void return type and no parameters. Yes, it is the basic signature thing. I will also show you another uh, signature having event. Now, let's see how to raise the process completed event. Consider the following implementation. Okay, so this is our implementation. And here, uh, you see with invoke method, actually it is invoking the notify event here. So how it is bound, it is bound with process completed notification and this is it, you see. So this is void business logic on process completed. And here it is invoking this event basically. So this is an event, you see event and events are called with invoke and you see it is also checking a null check with here. Okay, let's continue reading. Above, the start process, method calls the method on process completed, at the end, which raises an event. Typically, to raise an event, protected and virtual methods should be defined with the name on event name. Protected and virtual enable derived classes to override the logic for raising the event. However, a derived class should always call the on event name method of the base class to ensure that registered delegates receive the event. The on process completed method invokes the delegate using process completed. Invoke. This will call all the event handler methods registered with the process completed event. The subscriber class must register to process completed event and handle it with the method whose signature matches notify delegate, as shown below. And then there is the example. 
So here we define a business logic instance like here. Then we assign an event to the business process completed and it is not as coded yet. So let's call the event handler like this. So we have assigned process completed to this method. So when this process completed event is uh, notified, not, uh, the publisher notifies, this will be uh, executed and then we can call start process and the start process will call this method at the end of the process and at, at, the, at the end of the process the invoke will be uh, called and invoke is here. Okay. So this is, uh, let's uh, tell this, uh, well, let's say, let's uh, explain this in more details such as the event of, okay, process position is, or let's say, okay. The process position logic, okay, notified the subscribers process completed so this is this will be called when the process business logic notifies the subscribers okay so uh, let's add a date time why i am adding i will show you and then i will have multiple subscribers okay so how am i gonna do that um okay so here we are calling the uh, start process and here i will make something random that And here, uh, system, reading, thread, sleep, meal, uh, okay, my round, that next. So this will be based on milliseconds. So between one millisecond and 110 milliseconds. And then I will start multiple processes and bind them. So, or let's start 100 tasks task.factory okay i also need to add using system trading tasks start new okay uh, it will be like this i will take this into that okay we can also provide a let's say id like with ir id so let's add id to here and then yeah, okay let's also change our notification as in ir id okay so now i have to change my invoke method so on completed so invoke will require id and i will provide it id because we have changed the signature of the uh event okay and when it is invoked it will also get an overload okay so we also need to provide um a parameters so plus equal to top top and it requires a parameter coming from yeah it is requiring an id you see it has automatically generated so where do we where will we get this id if you ask in the process business logic we are going to provide uh start process with uh, id and therefore it will take i and for this i think we um 
okay we need to get this id from invoke method let me find an example c sharp invoke with parameters so we can invoke with class instance and parameters array okay c sharp invoke point even with parameters i think this is the keyword that we need to look for so when subscribing events how do we send parameters Okay, so this invoke will notify. Oh, I see. We don't need to. Okay, we have notify. The notify takes a parameter and then we have to pass it to the invoke. So the process completed is here. Yeah, I think I can keep it inside here. So this will be private. And if I make it private, maybe I can, you know, I, no, I have to make it public, I think. Okay, IR ID. So I will set this IR ID to this actually. Okay, so this dot IR ID equal to IR ID. Let's let's name this as ID of event. Okay, like this. And on process completed. So now we don't need to notify with parameters anymore. And let's remove this, remove this, and on invoke we can simply use oh this will be still taking IR ID. Yeah. So it has to be like that. We have to make it. And I will just you pro provide PL dot ID of event and when we start process okay so where is the error so the notify is void void okay mm, one moment plus equal to top okay where is the difference i don't see any difference here it is exactly the same. Okay. Okay, so on process completed, we don't need this, or we need this, yeah, like this, and we have assigned it, but we didn't provide ID, like
this and let's see what happens okay we have another problem Cannot implicitly convert type void to lecture program modify. I think it is because of what may it be. So this is void modify. This is also void. It says it matches the signature, but currently we are having a problem and maybe it is because this is static and this has to be non-static okay public event notify process completed process completed oh i think this has to be void No. public static void okay this is working but our parameter passing is not working okay and we didn't get anything because we didn't implement anything yet and let's put a breakpoint here to see what happens Oh, we are not waiting tasks to be completed so let's add a let's make a list of tasks or we can make it parallel for yeah parallel for is better option here and parallel for is not auto completing it yeah so from inclusive uh, one to 100 and then we will define a new action like this okay so the new action will be like body and so the body will be probably something like this here of let me check an example we have used that but i don't remember from memory Oh, it is like this, yeah. So index equal to okay, just just like this, yeah. 
and here uh, we will put it so each one of them will be a task and it will wait for all tasks to be completed to continue and we will just provide index okay now i get the logic so this parameter will be coming from here therefore we don't provide it here okay we don't provide any parameters here because they are coming from uh, process complete method invoke now let's run the application okay hundreds process started you see they are coming with different types it's starting hundred process and then uh, we are starting to get subscriber notification like this okay it is working so uh, let's make uh, the message more sense making okay process id equal to and we add some top character like this and top character like this and here um, uh, let's add okay and add some top character okay so, uh, oh we did, we have forgotten a plus sign okay uh, so in parallel for you see they are not executing with the uh, order that you would expect one start and then these start actually they are all executed immediately then they are started according to the uh, .NET uh, tasks therefore you see they are not with, uh, with the order that we provided they are started by the .NET uh, task uh, system and for example this is completed at this this is completed here process id for 49 then we will start seeing other processes getting completed and other processes are getting started we can also see how many processes are running in our application such as let's check it out from I think its name will be lecture 13 CMD somewhere. Okay, not here. So let's check here. And we can see it from here. Let's open the resources monitor. And on CPU, we can see okay so it has one not 100 threads as you see and because we are starting processes when we start the process it should immediately type to the screen however they are not or maybe we need to hit oh yeah we had to hit a key and yeah we can see so when i hit a key it just starts uh, it just stops printing so all processes started and they are getting notified as they are getting completed this is how you can make event binding it is extremely useful when you are waiting something to be completed and this is it this is how you define event delegate and notify subscribers how to define delegate and events to notify subscribers when an event invokes okay that's first time am i typing delegate correctly delegate 
Yeah. Okay, so we have seen this too. And only asynchronous and await keywords waiting. Let's check this too. Class coupling. So the class coupling is nested classes, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay. This is not a very important thing, actually. Code class matrix class coupling, but let's just read it. Okay. Code metrics class coupling. January 8, 2021. For minutes to read. Class coupling also goes by the name coupling between objects, CBO, as originally defined by CK94. Basically, class coupling is a measure of how many classes a single class uses. A high number is bad and a low number is usually good with this metric. Class coupling has been shown to be an accurate predictor of software failure and recent studies have shown that an upper limit value of 9 is the most efficient S2010. So, what is class coupling? It is a number of other classes a class uses. And you should not exit 9. According to the Microsoft documentation, class coupling measures the coupling to unique classes through parameters, local variables, return types, method calls, generic or template instantiations, base classes, interface implementations, fields defined on external types, and attribute decoration. Good software design dictates that types and methods should have high cohesion and low coupling. High coupling indicates a design that is difficult to reuse and maintain because of its many interdependencies on other types. The concepts of coupling and cohesion are clearly related. To keep this discussion on topic, we will not get into depth with cohesion other than to give a brief definition from KKLS 2000. Module cohesion was introduced by Jordan and Constantine as how tightly bound or related the internal elements of a module are to one another YC79. A module has a strong cohesion if it represents exactly one task and all its elements contribute to this single task. They describe cohesion as an attribute of design rather than code and an attribute that can be used to predict reusability, maintainability, and changeability. Class coupling example. Let's look at class coupling in action. First, create a new console application and create a new class called person with some properties in it then immediately calculate the code metrics. Okay, let's calculate code metrics of, of our classes. So when I right click, let's see where do we calculate the code metrics. Okay, maybe from here. How do we calculate? The code matrix maybe analyze calculate code matrix yeah for solution okay then it shows our classes so first let's see our process business logic class which is here and code source so I see the code metrics somewhere here right now. No. Hmm. Okay, why I don't see the code metrics of class? So But how this screen did appear? Why I can see it? Properties. No. 
window. Yeah, there's quote metric results. No, this is not what we want. Okay, and it shows class coupling one. We can see it from here, but I ca I couldn't find it uh, from displaying here. So this has one. And if I add another class inside it, such as let's add or another class okay like data store 2 and let's see what will become its quote metrics okay process business logic i'm going to add a property as prop it will be this and so it requires a type as let's say string and prop okay it requires an enumeration so oh so this is a limited class probably so let's use another class let's use stud uh, student okay and let's recalculate the code matrix okay analyze and okay code metric results and do we need to refresh or something let's see tools no and now let's check the business logic and the class coupling is now five you see it has increased it to five why because in the student class I don't know it is increased from one to five so let's read continue reading from the page let's look at class coupling in action first create a new console application and create a new class called person with some properties in it then immediately calculate the code metrics notice the class coupling is zero since this class doesn't use any other classes now create another class called person stuff with a method that creates an instance of person and sets the property values. Calculate the code metrics again. See how the class coupling value goes up. Also notice that no matter how many properties you set, the class coupling value just goes up by one and not by some other value. Class coupling measures each class only once for this metric no matter how much it is used. In addition, can you see that do something? has a 1 but the constructor person stuff has a 0 for its value currently there is no code in the constructor that is using another class what if you put code in the constructor that used another class here is what you get now the constructor clearly has code that uses another class and the class coupling metric shows this fact again you can see the overall class coupling for person stuff is 1 and do something is also one to show that only one external class is being used no matter how much internal code you have that uses it. Next, create another new class. Give this class some name and create some properties inside it. Now consume the class in our do something method within the person stuff class and calculate code metrics again. So as we add more classes, it increases and the magic number is nine do not um, exit nine uh, this is something that you uh, you want to be aware coupling and why to avoid magic uh, why to avoid exiting nine Alright, so for the next week, I will hopefully show you asynchronous and await keywords and exception handling uh, in a crawler. Uh, this week already we have, we are over 3 hours and 34 minutes. Let's upload our source code. Okay. What we already have here. Okay.
you need to make a project that uses these features to understand perfectly otherwise just typing them uh, you will understand a little bit but you will forget it later but once you use them in a real project uh, you will understand them currently having an idea of these things exist and that you can utilize them when you need them is sufficient because if you don't know what to do then you can't look for it you can't search for it so having an idea of what is available to do what is available to use uh, that is the important part once you have an idea that for example uh, generics are available that and then you can utilize it then you can look for generics and utilize it okay uh okay end of lecture 13 hopefully see you next week